Welcome back to our in-depth exploration of hemp, the plant at the crossroads of controversy, legality, and innovation. In part two, we dive into the evolving landscapes of hemp legalization, its pivotal role in the environmental movement, and the tantalizing possibilities of a world where hemp is fully legal. From the fields of California, known not just for its ancient red roots, but also as a battleground for environmental and cannabis policies, to the corridors of global power, where treaties shape the trade of natural resources, we're uncovering the complex tapestry of interests and surrounding hemp. We'll also touch on how these dynamics could influence broader drug policy debate in Latin America and reflect on significant legislation like the 2019 Farm Bill that's reshaping the industry. Join us as we unravel the multifaceted narrative of hemp and envision a future shaped by its full potential. Patrick, good to be here with you again. It's great. Tell us where the legality of hemp stands in 2024. You know, we heard on the news in 2016 that they had legalized cannabis in California, but that didn't affect hemp laws, or did it? <laughs> what about the farm bill in 2019, where they in enshrined the distinction between marijuana and hemp? Well, yeah, you hit the nail. Uh, there because in 2016 they really did not legalize cannabis because uh, they maintained the prohibition of hemp even wrote the prohibition of hemp into the into the law and, and like I said in the first video lighting up burning a plant that's not a very good use of it. Um, it did not affect hemp laws. In fact, the 2016 laws in California further prohibited hemp. Um, they did everything they can they could to enshrine the. They didn't need to re-prohibit it. It was already prohibited, but they they did that. Now that there was the farm bill of 2019 where they made the distinction between marijuana and hemp by hemp having to have 0.3% THC or less. And uh, a lot of states, including the most liberal states and the most conservative states, turned around and just banned hemp. Uh, there, there was some deregulation on the federal level but it le left the final say up to the states. And even further within the states, they left it up to the counties. And um, it's, you look at the world statistics, the country that provides the most hemp to the world is China. Secondly, Canada. Third, the United States. Fourth, France. And fifth, Chile. And you see those kind of statistics and it seems like, oh, the United States is third in the world of hemp production. But you could get those kinds of statistics just from having the pilot program, just because the United States is so big. In France and Chile, there's more hemp grown uh, per square mile than the United States. And I think later on we'll talk about more about this law and, and why it's not really the the uh, legalization of hemp like it's made out to be. I think it is interesting, though, that Donald Trump, of all the presidents, was the one to make the effort to legalize hemp because in the press, Donald Trump has been demonized as as against environmentalism. And there's a lot of fear that he would actually uh, uh, send federal troops to cut down marijuana uh, farms. I know there was a lot of worry about that when he came in in 2016, and that he made the most significant change to cannabis laws uh, since the 1937 Marijuana Tax, Tax Act, uh, which prohibited 
uh, hemp and cannabis, but he um, doesn't get enough credit for that. Um, I don't, I don't think, because um, we're really, we're seeing even now in the campaign, Trump the environmentalist, but uh, the media doesn't doesn't let us see this contribution that President Trump made. <clears throat> What's the relationship between hemp and the environmental movement? You have been in a position to observe the environmental movement from the inside, Patrick, since your, your county in California yeah. is famous for the oldest trees in the world, and it's also a county famous for growing pot. You've had a chance to see the fluctuations and changes happening in environmental policy and environmental activism for the 48 years of life. You know, I'm surprised how in preparing for this podcast, you say people in California actually want to keep hemp away, think that it shouldn't be grown. Yeah, uh, and you're right. Because of the big trees, the redwood trees, is, of course, cutting them down, very controversial. And I have observed the environmental movement for the, from the inside and between 2013 and 2000. 17, I was back in the United States. Some of that, a lot of that time was spent in Humboldt County. And um, sometimes the solutions are ch staring us in the face because, okay, cutting down trees, especially the ancient redwood trees, is so controversial. But what can be grown so that we don't have to cut down trees to make paper? Yeah. Duh. Obvious. Hemp. Um, now, of course, the redwood trees, you get more bang for your buck by ma making tables and, uh, and things like that because it's, it's such a high-quality wood. But still, um, the logging companies, because of, uh, of laws, that they're not allowed to, say, for example, if they wanted to say, okay, part of these, these forests have been cut. Now we're going to grow hemp there. They're not allowed to do to do that, um, they have to keep keep the, the same industry. We've talked a little bit before about that, but um, the re relationship, the, the environmental movement, has become to has become totally corrupted by this idea of what's ironically called sustainable development, but deindustrialization, anti growth, the, everything that we understand about like Agenda Twenty One and Agenda Twenty Thirty. Um, and the, the ideology coming out of Davos and the World Economic Forum. So any kind of new industry or any new growth is looked on as, um, as something that's going to be a negative. Um, now, Humboldt County is famous for growing pot, but it's exactly for that reason also that they don't want to have hemp because they're concerned that the hemp seeds could be blowing in the wind and then their marijuana plants could cross pollinate and it could lower the THC level. Like they need to have the highest THC level in the world, but that's, that's anti-market. Um, and uh, um, this is also one of the reasons that Humboldt County and many counties uh, as well as states have put a uh, prohibition on on hemp, um, and you can really see that Humboldt County hates hemp. I mean, when I was there, I, I read an article in a magazine that was written by a hemp expert and a hemp activist from Humboldt County, but she said, no, we shouldn't grow hemp in Humboldt County because we don't have the space, but that's not for her to decide. That's for the market to decide. Exactly. And, and there's such a, the laws are so restrictive um, no, the market needs, you mean? Well, well yeah. And actually, um, you know, since the legalization, so-called, in 2016 of, of marijuana, it's actually many family farms that were doing it on the black market. They, they, they can't function anymore because of all the licensing, the water restrictions, and all the, all the taxes. And it's actually led to a situation that favors big business. You know, I'm thinking, what would the world look like if hemp uh, were fully legal? I don't mean pilot programs that require complicated buy-ins, li li licensing, 
and tax schemes. Wow, that would be that would be amazing. You know, the United States almost had a sustainable hemp-based economy with the invention in 1917 of the hemp decorticator, a machine that processed hemp, and in the 19th century, of course, with uh, um, <clears throat> technological and industrial boom, and then all that was shot to shot to smithereens and. I like to see a, a future where there's biodegradable plastic made from hemp, and when you th throw it in the water, it returns to Mother Nature. And imagine hemp roads and hemp sidewalks that actually suck carbon and suck CO2 out and neutralize it, and hemp fields that, that neutralize the metals and actually uh, it's, it's amazing. I think that uh, it, and it's so sad that most people you ask, they don't even know what hemp is. And because of its association with marijuana, uh, especially here in Ecuador and also in the United States, people shut down and they, there's so much prejudice. Okay, I know this is a different thing, but there are some parallels. You told me that the Coca-Cola company, the international Coca-Cola company, actually has a treaty with the United Nations saying that they cannot be busted from shipping coca leaves in the U.S., and they are the only company that is allowed to do this. You, and and you, do, you did some research when you lived in Peru and I, found I that... I did. Exactly, and found that the Coca-Cola company was the largest annual buyer of coca leaves from the Peruvian government. You know, the arrangement that Coca-Cola has with the American government is actually written in treaties that, in, that the United Nations has signed it signed off on, you know? Yeah, as well as agreements with the Drug Enforcement Agency. Okay, so if a big company like this soft drink giant can have special permission to use this product, along with the agreement that they will be taking out part of the plant responsible for making cocaine mm -hmm. to be used just for flavor, then why couldn't big companies in the U.S. get a similar permission for hemp? You know, let's say because they wanted to make biodegradable plastics or paper products or concrete or insulation or biofuel mm -hmm. or whatever right like the rating agreement coca-cola has where they are going to, to to be bringing in an x number of plants using it for this product and the license is tied into the the, the use mm -hmm. all very specific in order to avoid any hint of narco trafficking well, yeah, and you're, what you're, you say is exactly true. And on the Coca-Cola bottle, when you read the ingredients under proprietary flavors, uh, that's going to be the coca leaf. And they sell the cocaine alkaloid to pharmaceutical companies, which can be used for anesthesia. I don't know if I said that word right. Yeah. Uh, when they have to numb, numb you for surgery. Um, it, yeah. Um, the problem is it, for these industries in the United States that potentially could be making products like concrete, paper, plastics, biofuel out of hemp, and they're going to need a, a local source because if they're buying it from China or Chile or, or, or someplace else or Canada, the, as a uh, import, it's going to be more expensive and the big companies that are currently involved in making plastics and paper or the cotton industry, for example, they don't want hemp products because it threatens their bottom line. And the, some of the ambiguity also between uh, w with how the hemp laws are now in the United States um, in terms of the uses that are allowed, the states that, were, that are allowed to grow it, it prevents this kind of uh, free market capitalism. Um, in the United States, we talk about having a free market, but it's really free market fantasies. I, I think what Coca-Cola does with the coca, coca plant is, is good, because um, they, but, but because they're such a big company, they're able to do it. And a question is raised, why only the Coca-Cola company? I mean, um, are they getting special treatment? Do they have a monopoly 
on the coca leaf. So th these are quest these are these are questions, but I, the, you raise an interesting point and it's an interesting, exactly. interesting parallel. <clears throat> exactly. And where do you see the legalization of psychoactive cannabis in Latin America? The theme of drugs is very controversial. We've seen micro traffic become a big problem in the school system and we're, we've even had to address it uh, as educators. We had to write a proposal of how to approach the thorny subject of micro-traffic in the school system where we live. Every so often, the subject of legalization of drugs is brought up in the National Assembly of, of Ecuador. Could him contribute something to this debate? Yeah, well, hemp already is contributing something to this debate because now Ecuador has a pilot program and you're seeing cannabis products, cannabis soaps, cannabis shampoos, cannabis um, medicine appearing, uh, canyamo, hemp products appearing in the Ecuadorian marketplace. But yeah, I think about that, that uh, proposal for how to deal with micro-trafficking in the school system uh, that, that we did write. And I think a, a lot of the problem is that in the Ecuadorian culture and in the Ecuadorian legal system, there's a, a confusion be, with cocaine, of course, uh, with the proximity with Colombia and the historic coal um, uh, a relation with the uh, Colombian drug cartels and Ecuador's own drug cartels. Um, cocaine is something that is part of our lives, you know, because of where where we are situated. But if you look at the my problem of micro-trafficking in the schools, by including micro-trafficking of marijuana, it makes it seem like it's a much bigger problem than it really is. And there's an exaggeration that occurs. And so if, if Ecuadorians could know that the effects, the medical effects and the uh, psychoactive effects of cocaine were totally different than marijuana, um, they would they would realize that the problem of the micro trafficking in the schools isn't as big as it as it is. Um, so I think that it's actually it does more harm than good to talk about the legalization of marijuana in the national assemblies of Latin America without first educating uh, the public about this plant. Because remember, when the United States made all cannabis illegal in 1937 it had a huge effect on the entire world policy, including the Middle East, Latin America. And so, um, I, ju I just think that hemp is a way that we can refocus, refocus the debate and move on to the more medicinal, uh, medicinal, uh, uses yeah. of, of the plant, including medicinal uses of the plant, they have THC, which doesn't have to be smoked, but like if somebody's sick, they can uh, eat it or ingest it. Um, so so it, it's a complicated subject, but it's made worse by the prejudices, prejudices about cannabis, the relation, the imagined uh, relation that cannabis has with cocaine, I mean, I, I've read uh, even in the newspapers here, they say that when they grow marijuana here, they're, they're mixing it with cocaine. And so I think that hemp could definitely con contribute something to this debate. Tell us more about the farm bill of 2019 that Trump signed into office. Well, sure, yeah. So... Donald Trump made the biggest change to hemp policy in 90 years, changing it from a plant that was in the same category as controlled substances like heroin and cocaine. But like a lot of areas of Donald Trump's policy changes, there's near silence on the part of the media, including many of the, his areas touching on environmentalism. We've seen that too this year in the presidential campaign that the media is silent about Trump, the environmentalist, you know, and his, his working with Robert Kennedy Jr. on, on environmental issues. And this was a huge change since hemp became illegal in 1937. But like a lot of Trump's legislation, he wanted to throw it back to the states. 
And it wasn't, it, I think it was largely symbolic. I mean, that's not to underestimate that pilot programs are good, but we need more. It wasn't a repealing of the law, though, just a five-year pilot program, research program, which may or may not be renewed. And for decades, federal law didn't differentiate hemp from other cannabis plants, all of which were effectively made illegal in 1937 under the Marijuana Tax Act. And this pilot program, essentially, it requires you to get a government stamp. <laughs> um, yeah. and, but hemp was, hemp was made further illegal in 1970 under the Controlled Substances Act, which banned cannabis of any kind. And it's true that hemp policy in the United States has been drastically transformed by this new legislation. However, there remain some misconceptions about what this, exactly this policy does. And there are such serious restrictions that I think I'm justified in still referring to the illegality of hemp or its quasi-legal state. Um, as soon as the federal government lifted the hemp ban, individual states decided to ban it. Some of the most conservative states like Idaho and Mississippi, as well as some of the most liberal states like California. Um, although in California, it was done county by county. Uh, and it's illegal in California in 25 different counties. And even the Trump 2019 farm bill on the federal level, I mean, it, it just gave, gave states opportunity to regulate hemp policy. And like we talked about before, you don't revive an ancient industry through complicated buy-in schemes and pilot programs. It, the risk to farmers for accidentally having one hemp plant that is over the 0.3% THC or less is so, so great and can lead to criminal charges, as does cultivating a hemp without a license. So let's say these farmers are in a place where it's legal to grow marijuana and they've also got some hemp, but the marijuana plant might be mixed with the hemp. That means their hemp is over the limit and that can be uh, that can send them to jail. So ultimately, the farm bill doesn't create a system in which people can grow it freely. It basically out outlines the situation for hemp research, not hemp agriculture. And like I said, Humboldt County, which is known as the pot capital of the world, they permanently banned hemp. They're anti-hemp. Uh, they, they hate, they hate hemp. And it, it's always ironic because Humboldt County is known for counterculture, it's known for being a hippie place, but they've been totally taken over by this idea of deindustrialization and anti-growth, as has the environmental movement as a whole. Okay, that's the end of our podcast, today's podcast. Thanks for joining us as we unravel the complex world of hemp from legislation to environmental impacts and global trade. Remember, the future of hemp is as rich and varied as its past. Keep questioning, keep discussing, and let's shape that future together. Until next time, stay green and keep growing your knowledge with us. Farewell.